before we add, before I also add additional commentary and introductions to Max, um, I wanted to hear from all of you. Um, since many of you know each other, but there's some of you who also don't yet know each other, uh, but also for Max's sake and also mine, um, we would love to hear, and we'll uh, start in no particular order, whoever would like to start can start the introductions, both your name, your institutional affiliation, and um, one, one reason that you're interested in learning more about social entrepreneurship and change making, and perhaps um, one hope or aspiration uh, for what you might learn today. And I'll take notes. Uh, let's see, who would like to start? Chrissy, would you like to start? <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Chrissy Garten, and I have the privilege of working in the Social Entrepreneurship and Sustainability uh, Initiative here at Rollins, um, and working with many of you, and hopefully more and more of you. Um, I'm particularly interested in this kind of concept of change making uh, because I think skill set is really important and I think we have no shortage of um, really passionate and mission minded students on this campus who uh, desire and assume that they will change the world in some way, shape, or form. And so uh, I'm really interested in preparing them with tools that are actually going to equip them to do so. professor of philosophy. I teach philosophy and women's studies at Rollins College. And um, I'm interested in the workshop because I already teach a lot of courses that deal with social justice issues and a lot of them are community engagement. And sometimes students do projects that are like doing a fair trade um, sale and fashion show or some kind of um, project that is related to um, so, uh, social entrepreneurship, but it's not really sustainable, right? And they do the project and then the class is over. So I'm actually interested in um, learning more about social entrepreneurship so that I can um, incorporate in classes so they can do more sustainable, like if they do a fair trade sale, it can continue to help the, it's usually cooperatives that are international, like in India, do a lot of stuff in India and Mexico, and so I'm interested in actually um, making that sustainable. Thanks. Hi, I'm Rachel Newcomb. I'm in the anthropology department here at Rollins, and I do also, like Margaret, I do a lot of community engagement projects in my classes, and I take students to Morocco, and I try to do international service learning as well, so I'm very excited to kind of get a new toolkit that I can impart to my students, because I don't know a lot about social entrepreneurship. Very exciting. I'm Karen Schultz. I'm the director of academic community here, so I work a lot with faculty on the brain technology I've done the opportunity to go to uh, work with several faculty on trips um, where we've done service learning or integrated some, some social entrepreneurship into the trip. And so I want to make sure that I can provide that um, expertise to that as we're going through these processes. Hello, I'm Lynn. Uh, I'm Tommy Warnke from the International Business Department at Rollins. And uh, my specialization is gender and development, so a lot of what I already have done for a long time is related to social entrepreneurship. But I'm particularly interested in learning more um, types of skill sets that I can convey to the students in the classroom because a lot of students are interested in these issues, but are kind of looking for a way that they can do something about it. So that's what I'm interested in. Michelle Stepper, and Professor of History and Director of the Women's Center. And I, um, like Chrissy, have been working, followed like all of you, working with students who are so passionate about social change, and I'm really interested in making sure they have the skill set to be entrepreneurs. And um, teaching a class that's interdisciplinary from women's studies perspective mm -hmm. on social innovation. So, wonderful. And I think that's probably the first in social entrepreneurship in the women's studies department. So, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Irene Wabi. Hi, my name is Toby Long. I'm a visiting professor in the chemistry department. 
and I am here today to gain additional training and, and learn a little bit more about social entrepreneurship so I can pass it along to my students. I think it's a, a special skill set that can be very useful even at the uh, non-majors level for chemistry. And incorporating that into a non-majors chemistry class, I think will uh, will definitely, uh, they, they will benefit from that. So, thank Fantastic. You. And I think that's awesome. That's so exciting. <laughs> I'm Carrie Coates, and I am with the Center for Advanced Entrepreneurship at Crummer. And I've been part of this journey from the very beginning, and so I'm partly here because I just love seeing more and more people get interested in the SESI initiative and in change making. Um, it's certainly a passion of mine, and I look forward to learning more every day about it and learning how I can help the students at Crummer and the undergrads learn more about it as well. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to apologize. I have a very strong voice, so I'm just telling my name. Mary Conway Dato On from Crummer, and like Carrie, I've been involved since the beginning, and I'll just do the rest of it. Good morning. I'm Susan Bach, and I'm with the Center for Leadership Development at the Crummer School. And I, I'm here, really here for two reasons. One, I have an extended family member who has become a social entrepreneur, and what she has done is in the process of being pretty amazing. And then um, I see a connection between social awareness and social entrepreneurship and leadership. So that's, that's my connection. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm Maria Ruiz. I'm from the psychology department. And I saw this literature and got very excited because I have been working on a new course entitled High Risk Behavior. Uh, and I'm a licensed psychologist and a board certified behavior analyst who's been wanting to get out of the classroom and use some of my, my practical skills uh, to teach outside of the classroom and out of, out of the box, as they say. And I, I've been calling anybody who will talk to me in the community, Nikki and uh, a number of people to see whether I need a C or an I or an F or something tagged along which of the alphabet letters would be best to put on there to let the students know that I'm doing something different. So I, I saw this and I, I called Chrissy and said, you know, can you tell me about this? This is maybe what I need. So here I am, hopefully making to learn what I might do outside of the classroom. Thank you. I'm Jerry Jessica, I'm the Cromer Graduate School of Management, and I teach promotional marketing and services marketing. Um, I also believe that we should limit our resources and way of thinking in business to just products and making money. I think a lot of the techniques could be applied into the context that we're going to be dealing with today in social entrepreneurship. Uh, my area of focus is communication, but the persuasive part of communication, which is advertising a lot of the digital media. And I think a lot of this is kind of a precursor to change in a larger context. We have the people who are drivers and want to make the change, but I think we have to develop a little more of an environment for change among people who are a little more hesitant. So that's the area of my focus, and I want to see some things I can apply to my classes and engage my students in the future. Good morning. I'm Deborah Wellman. I'm the Dean of the College of Professional Studies, and I have a number of my faculty that are very interested in this, so I thought it was good for me to come and learn if I can see how to support them. Hi, I'm Dr. Uh, Becky Maroon, and uh, I teach at the Hamilton Bolt School. Um, I teach uh, social media and rural culture, um, and I'm also the senior director of research and design for Ripio Institute, where we um, design and scale and evaluate social entrepreneurship uh, programs, actually. So I'm here to learn some tools to better bridge um, the professional application sanction of classroom. Good morning, everyone. I'm Nikki Meyer, the Director of Community Engagement. I heard this is where all the cool kids were going to be. So <laughs> I'm happy to come. Okay. Really, I'm, um, I'm so lucky to be involved with this since the beginning, and I feel um, that it needs a unifier for our campus, and it is um, essential for the evolution of many of our work in um, community engagement and service learning. So I'm excited to be here with all the cool kids. <laughs> we all know <laughs> um, my name is Leslie Parkins. I'm from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I work in the Center for Public Service there. I work in service marketing.
learning and collaborate with others in social innovation. It's still an area where I'm trying to learn. Um, there's lots of folks on our campus, and it's probably the same here, but there's pockets of people doing different things. And I would like to come back with some strategies that might help us collaborate more together and help us strengthen our efforts. So I'm looking forward to learning more today. I'm glad that Vicki encouraged me to be here too. Good morning, my name's Rob Piccolo. I'm a professor of management at Clummer. And uh, currently, I serve on the board of directors for the YMCA and for the Heart of Clark United Way. <clears throat> I just rolled off the board of Habitat for Humanity and the Beta Center. And I, I, in those roles, I get to watch uh, several entities, all with good intentions, try and address complex problems, whether it's homelessness or nutrition or, or health or uh, education, et cetera. And it's, it's, it's a, quite, a, quite a thing to see. And so uh, this is. This is self-serving in the sense that I would kind of want to see what could be done and should be done. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in a role both at the grammar school and in the community where I, I will see and have the opportunity to maybe I'll call you to figure out uh, the track of what we're doing. But um, projects are real, the opportunities are real, and I'm excited to see it go as well. Thanks. I know Q Plus, I'm a professor of finance at Cover. Uh, I'm interested in the financial aspects of social entrepreneurship. And I'm going to look for ways of incorporating this into my courses. Fantastic. Uh, my name is Julian Chambliss. I'm a history professor. Um, I do a lot for the community engagement in my courses. I'm also a very active and active social worker. I think that uh, my goal in trying to do this was to learn more about social entrepreneurship and see how perhaps that can be used to enhance the questions of heritage tourism and historical. Fantastic. Good morning, I'm uh, Richard Doyen. I'm an uh, assistant professor in the Central Business Department. Uh, I teach uh, finance investments and real estate. Uh, the reason I'm here is I'm interested in being in the workshop, uh, so I can look into active learning and bring teaching methods into the classroom to do that. Uh, and the reason why, first of all, everyone is probably an entrepreneur anyway, they just don't know it yet. And my view is if you're going to do something, you want to teach people how to do the right thing right, as entrepreneurs do. Good morning, I'm Keith Wiggin. I'm a faculty at the Primer School and uh, teach courses in adult sustainability and uh, team teachers. I'm a part of the course of social entrepreneurship and sustainability. And uh, I'm always looking forward to some of the other things. One of the reasons being a faculty member is that I get to be a lifelong student. So I'm always, I'm here to learn. And I'm particularly always interested in finding ways to help uh, people in general, the students in particular, connect their passions with the challenges and the skills. And I see this as a tremendous area to where that can have a great benefit for all of society. Um, I guess I think that it's a small of the philosophy department. Um, here for two reasons. Um, one is I serve on the board of some NGOs, the ACLU in Washington. And then also I teach courses in which students engage with the community. So I think what I'm here to learn is how to enhance my participation in those groups and hopefully enhance the students' experience as they do. I'm Barry Allen. I teach courses in sustainable development in the environmental studies department. Uh, many of our students are out to change the world, and I'm hoping to learn some tools to help them do it. I'm Dan Chong. I teach in the politics department here. Uh, I do human rights and little poverty, and I've kind of dabbled in social entrepreneurship themes and skills in a couple of my courses in international field studies. So, uh, most interested in how to uh, use social entrepreneurship across the liberal arts undergraduate curriculum, which I think is a fairly unique challenge we have here at home. <laughs> my name is Manuel Koji, and first of all, I want to apologize for my leg. I told Chrissy I, I needed to do something in my, in my daughter's school. I'm so sorry. Um, but I am with the International Business Department and um, my area is operations management. Um, I've been an entrepreneur as well. I've built a business from scratch and seen other people build businesses from scratch as well. Um, and I think that there's, there's a tension between entrepreneurship and operations management. Um, how do, do entrepreneurs think about operations, think about processes, think about sustainability of the business and so on. And I want to see how that fits well when we think about entrepreneurship and social problems. Hi, my name is 
Ivan, and I'm uh, with the International Business Department as well. Actually, I'm working right now with an organization called Dialogue in the Dark, which is a not-for-profit social franchise type of uh, organization uh, out of uh, Hamburg, Germany. And uh, Andreas Henneke is actually a fellow of uh, Sharma Fellow, and I found it uh, very interesting. Perhaps I can learn about uh, how uh, social franchising and social entrepreneurship are Andreas is one of our absolute favorite of the fellows, and he'll be, uh, we work very closely with him, so it's a that you also work with him. Good morning. Uh, I'm Jay Yellen, a uh, math professor here. Um, I, um, my, my one experience with community engagement, um, recent experience, was uh, I took my RCC class. Uh, these are first-year students, um, and every Monday uh, we went to Fern Creek uh, Elementary School, and my kids work with the fourth grade uh, kids, helping them with their uh, mathematics one-on-one, -on -one. and uh, it was so gratifying to see um, the effect it had on my kids as well as the fourth graders, so that really meant a lot. Um, and um, one of my areas of interest is uh, operations research. And um, uh, one of the students that I'm working with, uh, some of you may know him, he's uh, A.C. Raghavendra. Um, he and I have been working on a portfolio optimization project, and his plan is to implement it uh, in Nepal. Uh, to help low to middle uh, income people in uh, Nepal. So other than that, I, I have no idea what the role of mathematics per se would, would play in social entrepreneurship. So I'm excited and eager to learn. Fantastic. Great. I'm going to get enough to piggyback on what Dr. Jay Adams said. I'm Dr. Jay Shivamogi, and uh, I work with uh, the top students here in Rollins, and uh, I'm the campus representative for many scholarships. And so uh, I have this incredible responsibility almost of uh, when all these motivated students come to my office, I need to help them channel their uh, aspirations and their ambitions and connect them with the right people on campus. And uh, uh, so it is very important for me. I know most of you in this room. I know what you do. I tell my students I call myself a matchmaker. Mm -hmm. And so it's very important for me to know what everyone does. Like I said, piggybacking on uh, what Dr. Jay said, um, Casey and uh, his senior Ari, who work on the scholars from Nepal, showed up in my office in their first years and said, uh, we really want to take this uh, spirit of community engagement uh, to our home country and show my school fellow students here what poverty in Nepal is like. And through that, uh, uh, service organization making lives better was born. And today, on campus, we have raised more than $1,000. And we have helped uh, renovate a couple of schools in a village in the work has been so successful that we feel that our work in that village, Dodi, is uh, at a very decent place to where we can now move on to another village. The sustainability is what we were very excited about because of the work we did. It was very interesting to see how the villagers in Dodi uh, began to feel that if we could come in and work for their school, they need to take ownership for this little school and it was very interesting to see a change in attitude that we were able to build. And uh, Casey who is now working for the lower and middle class people through portfolio management also created something called Mission Aqua. Mm -hmm. I mean our Office of Community Engagement gave him the seed money, $500, uh, to put in uh, water filters in these poor schools. And when we went there, we, uh, we installed the filters and we realized that students needed water bottles. So they started taking uh, pure purified water home 
and they started telling their parents, can you drink dirty water? So all of a sudden, the entire village uh, was uh, drinking clean water, and so the, the plan is to expand Mission yeah, Alpha, right. and so I'm very excited to be here with all my <coughs> friends and colleagues, so I can tell all of the students the wonderful work you all are doing, and come and come. Fantastic. Okay, our last few introductions. We're in the home stretch. Jenny West, not from Rollins, not from Florida. <laughs> I teach so far, but I also am co-facilitating a new center on our small campus, Fairham College, we're in Southwest Virginia. My colleague Dave and I have been to a little bit of, of this world, so we're very much new learners, but very excited enough. I'm making a list of the diversity of your fields. So I can go back to campus and say, see, you know, I'm a mathematician, or this, or that, everybody interested. So we're very excited to be here. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm David Sultan. I'm also from Durham College, Southwest Virginia, to Mountain South and New York Mountains. I'm the director of professional studies there, and one of my specific goals here is that we're trying to develop a certificate in social entrepreneurship. <laughs> but uh, trying to determine what courses do we have and what might we need to add as far as you know active learning stuff and everything as well in order to put this certificate together and all the business students. Fantastic. Okay, Jennifer Hall, I'm a
last couple, so Lewis and then we have our... Hmm. Not the last. Um, <laughs> good morning. My name is Luis Martinez. I'm an organic chemist by passion and training. But don't hold that against me. Um, I'm actually a normal person. Um, I teach in the chemistry department here at Rollins. Um, I've always been very interested in science-based entrepreneurship, technology-based entrepreneurship. Uh, back in an earlier life, I worked with a large number of uh, small biotech startup companies. You know, two guys in the lab ran kind of things. And um, I've been very interested, obviously, in, in Entrepreneurship. So, from that perspective, how we translate that to social entrepreneurship, my connection, my interest falls in the following sort of area. And that's the following. Some, some social entrepreneurship activities, on, um, endeavors, have a technical or scientific component that's important in order to either make it a success or to leapfrog it into the point where it becomes a, a scalable success. So, I'm very interested in those kinds of processes and those kinds of solutions. And I'm here to learn. Okay, now our last introduction. Uh, if you can introduce your name, uh, your institution affiliation, uh, perhaps one reason why you're interested in social entrepreneurship, and one thing you'd like to learn today. Uh, I'm uh, Charlie Rock. I'm in the economics department. Uh, I've been studying alternative business since my whole career. Uh, since I was in the Peace Corps, trying to develop small community businesses there. I'm here, I guess, to uh, find out if this is just a repackaged ideas that have already existed for many decades, or whether it's a new means to try to pry through some of the grants and economies subsidies because I think the literature that sounds like stuff I've read for decades already. Okay. <laughs> Great. Well, we look forward to a very interactive and very engaged and very diverse discussion, given the diversity of everyone's backgrounds. Um, but before I do a brief introduction of myself and Max and, and how we've come to see the, the role of the Faculty Institute, I just wanted to throw back at you some of the key things that I heard in your introductions. And first and foremost, some of the things that struck me were just the, the huge amount of commitment you have to making your students successful and develop the skills uh, to help them achieve real social impact. And that, you know, given that that came up over and over again, it really is, you know, the key educator's um, goal uh, to make a lot of these skills and tools valuable for students. But also what came out was not only the diversity and the openness of all of you to learn and figure out how to apply the elements of social innovation and change making to across a broad range of disciplines, but it really is that you are all walking the talk and living a lot of the values of social change uh, and social impact yourself, and that many of you are doing amazing work in local and global communities and you are being entrepreneurial yourself. So I think just hearing the passion and the commitment and the values alignment in all of you and your kind of wish for what your students can, can, can benefit from is by far the most important starting place um, that you see yourself as uh, real leaders in social change and, and having those values as an educator. Um, but then secondly, I wanted to say that, uh, again, the diversity of disciplines was brought up as something very unique. Um, and I think this is both a testament to the, the, the alignment of values across Rollins, um, but I also think this is a testament to the fact that while this is a very burgeoning space in the academic, academic world, um, it really is something that is increasingly relevant across multiple disciplines. So this will be a theme that will come up over and over again, that it really is not just for um, the business school context, it really is something that um, Middlebury College, for example, is, is, is rethinking how social innovation, creativity, and innovation more broadly are tool sets and skill sets that can be used to apply a new way of um, uh, bringing the liberal arts to life. Um, and so, you know, there are other liberal arts colleges asking the question, how do the values and ideas of social innovation make sense um, uh, now in the liberal arts tradition and not just for business school contexts? Um, but also, um, it was I was hearing about this, the really wonderful range of disciplines and perspectives that are here, I just wanted to throw out a few exciting new developments that are starting to bubble up. Um, and again, I say bubble up because just as I mentioned, 
that, that Rollins probably has the first course related to social entrepreneurship in women's studies, I was able to say something very similar to a female professor who's in Queens College in New York, and she is a historian, and she particularly is an Africanist, um, and she created, this was a couple years ago, the first course on the history of South Africa through understanding leading social innovators in a historical context and how that was built into different social movements throughout history. And so she put the lens of social innovation, particularly focusing on the innovators throughout history, um, but was able to teach it within you know, history class. Um, and, and also, um, at, a re at recent faculty institutes, we did have a statistician um, who creatively thought about how to incorporate social entrepreneurship into his problem sets. So he wasn't necessarily teaching about social entrepreneurship. However, he found that students found the problem sets on how to do the chi-squared test more engaging when the problem actually was pulled from real, um, real case studies of social entrepreneurs working on, for example, population demographics in India. You can take a lot of the same statistics, couch it in a real world example, and it makes statistics very fun and engaging. So I think, you know, mix and match how you apply and integrate it um, in different disciplinary contexts, but I'm happy to connect you with the statistics professor to see if the students loved it. Um, and then even in the chemistry example, um, we have a couple chemists here. Um, you know, the chemist, when we spoke to him, this was at another faculty institute, he said, my starting point for coming to chemistry was really to help figure out how drugs can save lives. And I see myself as a social change agent. And somewhere along the way in teaching, you have to teach so many basic things. I want to figure out how to infuse some of that original passion around chemistry as a tool for social change back in there somehow. And so Max and I were brainstorming different case studies. But there's actually an Ashoka fellow um, who created the first nonprofit um, pharmaceutical company, the Institute for One World Health. And there are several other, so we then were able to figure out how do you draw the links of drug development, drug discovery, and um, social change, um, and, and how all those pieces fit back together um, to tell a larger story about the role and importance of social innovation in a chemistry context. So I think, you know, what's exciting is that it's, it's new and developing and burgeoning, and that particularly for many of you who are kind of thinking about forays in this space, you will be the first in your, your domain, but there are also many other people who are taking a lot of these same steps as well, and we're happy to connect to you and really keep the conversation going. Um, and, uh, and then in terms of a little bit about Max and myself, so we actually met back in 2001. I was a student interning with Ashoka at the time um, to do initial research on mapping the landscape within the United States of the emerging social entrepreneurship education networks. So uh, I did a lot of research of how this, mostly the student drive and the student demand was affecting the development of new courses, new uh, funding opportunities, new co conferences, and um, professors that were starting to get more involved in this space. Um, what was interesting is in 2001, it was primarily at the business school level, and it was primarily graduate. Um, and it's come a long way since then. But that research initiative got me in contact with Max. And we met because he was teaching the first course in social entrepreneurship in Europe. And he was also doing, at the same time, research mapping all the different university programs in social entrepreneurship. So we were connected through that. Um, and we've been working together in many different contexts, but particularly in the last few years, um, Max and I have been lucky enough to work on at least four different faculty institutes together, um, both in the US uh, with other change maker campuses, as well as most recently um, uh, internationally in both Korea and Mexico. Um, and the, the real purpose of the faculty institute is well, multifold. It really is to, to have for the faculty members a space and an opportunity to learn about and ask questions and think uh, both rigorously about uh, social entrepreneurship and, and more deeply understand it so that you can teach it. Um, but I think the other, the other uh, opportunity is having an open space to understand and grapple with how this might make sense with your discipline and hear lots of different other
different examples about how social entrepreneurship is being taught across different disciplinary domains. And we'll be, throughout the afternoon in particular, walking through more the nuts and bolts of what can go into a class on social entrepreneurship, and also talk about different kinds of adaptations according to different disciplines, because ultimately, you guys are the experts in your, in your domain and your field, and we, you're not trying to pretend to have all of the answers, but really different ingredients that might be useful as you mix and match and make it relevant for your own courses. Um, trying to think of any final things. And it really is just that, you know, the lens and hat that I'm bringing is that I really was um, most uh, initially inspired as a student leader in social entrepreneurship myself. So deep inside of me, it really also is a deep resonance for a lot of these ideas and skill sets and even career aspirations around social innovation are coming from the students. Um, and this has really changed in the last 10 to 15 years in particular, that a lot of these ideas really deeply resonate with students. Um, and I think the, the question is how universities are, are uh, being able to respond to that demand. And I think Rollins is doing an incredible job. And the fact that you're all here is, is uh, a, a testament to that. Um, but I also have been spending the last nearly seven to ten years at Ashoka uh, at the intersection of the many universities around the world that are starting to teach and starting to build up very robust programs in social entrepreneurship. Um, so throughout the day, we'll also be weaving in different examples of what's going on in other campuses. Um, yes, I wanted to take a pause before we start um, and just let everyone know that you have two different sheets in front of you, um, one of which is a pre-evaluation with three very short, simple questions, another of which is a post-evaluation that we'll be uh, having people fill out at the end of the day. So if you could just take 30 seconds, um, I'll come back and think 30 seconds to get started if you can just fill out those questions. Thank you. Sorry, you actually only have the pre evaluation. Oh, okay. So that's what we're working on. <laughs> and if we don't, we'll keep your hand up and bring one right to you. Okay, so 
So I'm going to get started and Chrissy will continue gathering the pre-evaluations. So, um, very briefly, um, I would like to make sure we're at least all speaking from the same basic language and basic context before we get more into the uh, advanced concepts and have Max uh, make the case for why you might be interested in teaching social entrepreneurship and couch it in some you know, global historical evolutions. Um, but first, um, I'm assuming many of you have heard of Ashoka, but I also wanted to give a little bit of context from where Ashoka thinks about social entrepreneurship. So many of you may have seen the quote, but this is really the crux of how Ashoka thinks about social entrepreneurship. This is a quote by Ashoka's CEO and founder, Bill Drayton, um, which is, social entrepreneurs are not content just to give a fish or even teach how to fish. Social entrepreneurs do not rest until they, re they have revolutionized the fishing industry. And so again here, the, the key crux of it is in the way Ashoka thinks about social change, it really isn't about handouts or charity or donations um, or, um, or something that becomes a, a recurring need to continue to help people. It really, and it really isn't even just helping people help themselves. It's thinking about what are the intervention points to make the problem completely go away. And so there's, there's definitely an element of self-reliance, there's an element of deep partnership and collaboration with communities, but the other element is about pattern change and systems change. So um, when Ashoka goes through the selection process and, and looks at someone who might become selected as an Ashoka Fellow, it really differentiates the people who are doing really good work, um, but they're still not fundamentally changing the system. Um, and that's the level of um, uh, social impact and scale that Ashoka is looking for. And just to take a step back, while Ashoka is known for selecting leading social entrepreneurs around the world, most recently the evolution of the most crystallized form of Ashoka's vision is what we call a world where everyone can be a change maker. And hopefully a lot of you can resonate as educators that you know ultimately it isn't about a few elite leaders who are, who are you know changing these systems and patterns and you know that is the, the role of Ashoka Fellows. Um, but they also are there to be role models, inspire everyone at a community level and everyone in different kinds of industries to think about the role they can have. And so for Ashoka, it really is a world where everyone is empowered to see how they can be a, a force of change in the world. A bit of context, Ashoka operates in 70 different countries. Um, we have Ashoka Fellow, about 3,000 Ashoka Fellows across these 70 countries. Um, what is different about Ashoka from what most people think of as most foundations is that Ashoka doesn't care about issue area and even geography. We try to find these people, these social entrepreneurs that are solving the root of problems and, and breaking those patterns of of, of poverty or the, po uh, the problems of uh, healthcare systems that are broken or education systems that are broken. Um, and so, you know, it really is very global, every single issue area you can imagine, um, and it really is at the point where the problems are being solved in a real way. The name Ashoka, everyone asks us this question, um, and uh, it's actually an Indian name. It was this uh, 3rd century BC and Indian emperor, Emperor Ashoka, um, who is largely credited as being one of the first social entrepreneurs, social innovators, united with the, sub the Indian subcontinent and also um, uh, in Sanskrit the term Ashoka means active absence of sorrow. Um, and also from a marketing context, it always shows up Ashoka, the first organization on every list, which is always helpful for people to find. Yes? Yeah, I just wanted to add a comment because Indians are so proud of this emperor Ashoka if you look at the Indian flag, at the center of the Indian flag is the wheel. And we call it Ashoka Chakra, the wheel of Ashoka. So Ashoka is very near and dear to Ashoka. Yes. And actually the, the term Ashoka is so widely known in, in uh, across India that uh, people often get confused because there's an Ashoka sign on every single street. So we're very well known across India. <laughs> 
Um, and in terms of funding, so Ashoka is technically structured as an intermediary funding organization. Um, so all of our funding goes to support Ashoka Fellows, um, but we do raise that money. Uh, so we don't, we're not a private foundation at all. Um, and most of it comes from entrepreneurs, some foundations, and individuals as well. And so there are three key strategies of Ashoka all going towards this goal of creating a world where everyone can be a change maker. Um, and you know, the first one that we're best known for is like, identifying and selecting Ashoka Fellows. Um, in some cases, it's like the Oscars of social change or the Nobel Prize of social change. Um, it, it ultimately uh, finds people at a point where they've already proven their idea, but they need support to be able to scale it up and make it sustainable on an ongoing basis. And so Ashoka comes in and supports with three years of a living stipend, which is basically a full-time salary, so that if they had to have a job and they were doing this project on the side, it really is allowing them to be focused full-time to make it fly. Um, and in the process, you know, I'll come to some of these statistics, many of them are working on it 20 years later, many of them have had it affect national policy, many of them have had their ideas independently replicated by other organizations because they're so transformative. And secondly, the second level is beyond supporting these individual social entrepreneurs, Ashoka as a global organization has the ability to see patterns. So our second level is what we call collaborative entrepreneurship, and that's bringing together lots of Ashoka fellows working in similar issue areas across different geographies to try to come up with even better solutions and insights um, uh, within broader issue areas. And then thirdly, um, building infrastructure for systems change. And so I lead Ashoka U, which is Ashoka's university initiative, and we very much believe in the power of universities and educators to arm students with the ideas that they can make a difference in the world and then some of the tools and skill sets around how they might be able to do that. And so we, we very much see um, the university partners that we have as a really critical lever for creating an everyone to change in the world. So as I mentioned, there's uh, 3,000 Ashoka Fellows globally, um, that, you know, started in India, Brazil, Mexico, Indonesia, um, and now it's really all over the world that social entrepreneurs are where there are problems in need of solutions. Um, and there's some really interesting statistics in terms of impact, longevity, and scale that, again, 60% of Ashoka Fellows have changed national policy within five years of being selected in Ashoka Fellow. 90% of Ashoka Fellows' ideas are replicated by other groups, which they see as success because it's spreading of the idea. Um, and 83% uh, have changed the system at a national level within 10 years. So some of you may have heard of a book by David Bornstein called How to Change the World, The Power of Social Entrepreneurs and New Ideas. Um, and just some of the key elements that define social entrepreneurship are it really is um, people who look to solve social problems at the root cause and system level, as I've been mentioning, which is Ashoka's focus but that they're particularly interested in looking for strategies that are innovative, sustainable, scalable, and measurable. Uh, and they're always looking for new ways um, to solve major problems. And, you know, there's a lot of certain attributes like entrepreneurs in terms of, you know, relentlessly pursuing their visions and not taking no for an answer, and they, they ultimately want to keep going until it's reached a certain critical mass. And you know, Ashoka, back to the idea of systems change, this is a nice graphic with the fish, that for the most part, the social entrepreneurs have these ideas and understandings of what might work uh, to solve very entrenched, complex social problems, but they're often one of the first people to see this new pattern. So for the most part, they're the fish swimming in the wrong direction. Um, and then over time, as they pick up steam and as they get um, collaborators and grow the scale of their organization, um, you know, they have more momentum. But that really, you know, in terms of after 10 years or so of working on the idea, there's many, many more people looking at the world in the way they're seeing it than the other way around. And they fundamentally changed patterns. So there's a, a great quote, I forget who says it, in terms of describing entrepreneurs 
that um, you'll basically tell an entrepreneur, you're crazy, you're crazy, you're crazy, oh, that's obvious. And it really is the same thing that, you know, for the most part, you're pushing against norms, you're pushing against the status quo, and then once you've pushed hard and long enough, and there's enough people who you've convinced, um, it, it flips, and it actually becomes so obvious that everyone else thinks, you know, well, you've been thinking this. Um, and so that's, that's the work of the entrepreneur. I wanted to give a few different examples of the range of types of social entrepreneur. And you know, David Bornstein, whose book I just referenced, he is a, a very, he got a lot of pushback from his book, The Power of Social Entrepreneurs and the New, the New Ideas, because he said, uh, people said that he was making these heroic, mythical social entrepreneurs and it was in some ways demoralizing students because I can't be that incredible. Um, no, no, it's true. They, he did get a lot of, uh, people were so inspired and they said, that's not me. So a lot of what David Bornstein is now trying to talk about is that social entrepreneurs, you know, they can be heroized, but really they just don't give up and they just keep going. But they are often quiet, shy, um, not always that charismatic. Um, and so there's a lot of these stereotypes that are not true about social entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, and I just wanted to tell a few different examples to illustrate some of that. So the Polaris Project is, some of you may have heard about who work in the you know, human rights space. Um, it was founded just over 10 years ago by some students who graduated from Brown University. And incidentally, um, Derek, so the two founders are there in the, in the magazine cover, Derek Ellerman became an Ashoka Fellow. Um, he was actually the youngest Ashoka Fellow selected at the time. I believe he was 23 or 24. Um, and he's now launched multiple other ventures. But um, he, he and his co-founder, Catherine Chan, were anthropologists by training. And they had spent most of their time doing um, very local work in the Providence area throughout their entire time in college, very much focused on um, creating networks of local service or organizations to work with the, the most um, disadvantaged um, populations in the community. And so they were very deep in the community engagement work. They were very deep in understanding how you build bridges across different local authorities. And that founded, you know, that gave them the insights around what became the Polaris Project, even though their idea turned into having global scale. So they actually, they're based in Washington, D.C., and it, it does a, a combination of things, but I mean, it, as 23-year-olds who just graduated from college, they were tackling the global sex trade industry and, um, you know, going with police to do busts and brothels, you know, and really, really hardcore work. But the ultimate thing also came down to pattern change and policy change. Um, and so they, they scale their organization, it's in multiple countries, it affects thousands and thousands of sex workers per year, um, and they've been working on it for over 10 years. Catherine Chan is still the executive director, Derek has moved on to other ventures. Um, but really, you know, as anthropologists from, you know, from an undergraduate uh, background, you know, they just were so committed and so um, con convinced um, that this had to happen because it wasn't, you know, can continue uh, that they, they founded that. Here's another story of a student uh, founder. Um, Billy Parrish uh, was an environmentalist and really wanted to see how universities could play a powerful role and contribute to reducing the global carbon emissions. So he, he had two different tacks, one of which was a student strategy, one of which was a university president strategy, both of which were hugely successful. Um, he, he basically built a, a national coalition of student organizations that convene every year with a, a, an annual a power shift conference. And he's activating the, the most committed student sustainability advocates. Um, but the, the larger um, shift he's, he's having beyond educating and training the next generation of environmental leaders is really thinking about how universities as institutions can reduce their global footprint. And so he got 400 university presidents to sign on to reduce their, their carbon emissions to be uh, 585, committed to becoming climate neutral. And then the student leaders in the broader network were the ones who helped advise and implement a lot of the changes on campuses. 
so it worked hand in hand. But uh, that was something that took several years, and it's still going the full force. Is you know, I'm sure it's uh, active on your own campus. That when there is uh, a moment of opportunity um, and you find the right structures, um, you can really have massive scale and impact. Um, someone mentioned a little earlier um, fair trade. Um, and so Transfer USA, Paul Rice is an Ashoka Fellow who was pretty pivotal in terms of fair trade certifications. Um, and he's worked very closely with a lot of uh, cooperatives across Central America, which is where he also did his Peace Corps. Um, and that um, gave him the local contacts and the relationships and the, the passion to think about how can he better empower and create the market access to the U.S. And so he was one of he basically, Transfair was the one that got Starbucks to sign on for fair trade coffee. Um, and so he you know, really has played a pretty pivotal role in a lot of people who drink coffee uh, from Starbucks. Um, and he now is launching uh, Transfair campuses so that students can actively endorse and have their own um, fair trade coffee uh, programs on campuses, which is all he really sees the students are a huge um, network of, of consumers um, who can do really important things. And then I won't go into this final example, but just what I was hoping to demonstrate is that you know social <coughs> entrepreneurs can be students or recent graduates. Social entrepreneurs can be uh, professionals who've had you know a few decades of experience. Um, it can be involved in you know the food, you know edu uh, the, the kind of the food and school lunches uh, domain. It can relate to um, kind of fair trade coffee or sustainability or human rights. I mean, really, the social entrepreneurs that we're we're you know lucky to work with across the Ashoka network, they come from all domains, um, and they are not necessarily uh, trained as business leaders either. So a lot of them have to learn on the job, but. Where their initial impetus comes from is a deep passion to do something um, that will trans, you know, really uh, reframe a problem uh, into something that doesn't exist anymore, and that they will keep going until they hit a certain scale and a certain level of systems change um, to change broader uh, behaviors. So those were just a few examples of the social entrepreneurs, but where do the universities come in? And so, you know, our, our hypothesis is that, you know, education and university time in someone's life is, is really a pivotal opportunity that if you can influence some of these values of social change, community engagement, get them out and exposed to a lot of the communities and understand the complexity of the problems, but if you also lay that over with a lens of stories of some of these social entrepreneurs that have done things that that are sustainable, that are scalable, and that are working. Um, and then you, you know, get students to think about how that might, you know, work in their own context, given their own skill sets and given their own passions. I think that's a huge opportunity um, as educators. Um, and uh, I just wanted to shift a little bit about a show we you, but first open it up if there are any questions at all. Yes, a lot of that will be from Max. Um, so I'm giving more of the broader, the broader overview of Ashoka and Ashoka U, and then that'll go straight into Max. And then a lot of the afternoon will be really focused on the educational content. Do you have um, profiles for all the change maker at the Ashoka Fellows? Do you have profiles? There's all? actually so there's three thousand of them, and yes, there are written profiles that cover the history of the person. The, the idea that they're working on, the problem and the solution and the strategy in the Ashoka website, and you can search by region, by issue, by name, so ask the light. You, 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 may, you may get at this, but you mentioned that they were undergraduates and they did this once they got out of college. Is that because colleges don't provide the opportunity within the framework of the existing curriculum? to allow them to try this before they are out there? Yes and no. I think a big part of it is that um, Ashoka looks for social entrepreneurs that have uh, 
a certain amount of success and they've learned what model works before we come in and then they can scale it up. But just to give two counterpoints, the first example I provided was um, some students who went to Brown University and they would argue that their um, service and community engagement experience in addition to their research on understanding the complexity of a lot of these global social problems inform the organization they created after graduation and they would say that their educational experience enhanced and actually gave them the confidence and the skills to be successful. On the flip side, Billy Parrish, who was the environmental advocate, um, he dropped out of college because he was not supported. He didn't feel supported by his own college environment. So, you know, and he's very vocal that he wants to advocate for how universities can encourage people to stay in college so that they feel supported and incubated so they don't need to drop out. So point well taken. I think it happens both sides of the board, but um, I think the, the question becomes if Rollins is actually looking to support and nurture people who see themselves as social entrepreneurs, are there opportunities for that flexibility inside and outside of the classroom, and, and how can the the academic environment enhance their potential work in the future. And so very briefly, um, Ashoka U envisions a world where all campuses can be change maker campuses or, or really where students feel that <coughs> educational experience is enhancing and giving them the tools and frameworks that will help them you know, succeed in having an impact in the world. Um, and we're just as eager, um, and we found that students really appreciate rigorous academic support tools just as much as a lot of the real world learning and community experience. They have to go hand in hand. And I think especially when you're looking at the complexity of social issues and the, the number of different people out there working on existing um, organizations and solutions, I think uh, a research-based approach and a, a deep understanding of context will really add to impact. And so, you know, since Rollins, Rollins is a change maker campus, I will jump through this very quickly, but ultimately, you know, social entrepreneurship is springing up at colleges and universities around the world. I'll go through this, some, some of the statistics about that a little later this morning. Um, but uh, what Ashoka U is, is finding is that the universities that are embracing this campus wide are, are really building out uh, ecosystems um, where this relates across disciplines. Um, and Ashoka U is, is looking to find a lot of these pioneer universities, just like Rollins, um, that are asking a lot of these questions around how does social entrepreneurship make sense amongst all of the existing activities we're doing, how does it reflect the values of Rollins, and how can we bring a lot of the pieces together to make it easy for students to navigate. Um, and ultimately, you know, we hold up examples of what Rollins is doing um, for other campuses, um, so this can spread to become more of a, a global movement. So we'll please. Uh, one is, uh, why did you choose the name uh, entrepreneur? Did that come out of the business school movement at uh, Stanford and other schools? Or it's uh, such a loaded word. It, right? it really is, and I think you, yep. My second question, uh, <coughs> if you give Rollins this award, why do you charge the university so much money with so the first question, um, Ashoka was founded 32 years ago, and the the so right now it's Ashoka colon Innovators for the Public, and the term um, in the beginning was a public innovator, um, and. Uh, people tended to associate that uh, over time with government, and a lot of what Ashoka is about is independent citizens taking action and feeling a sense of agency to do something positive in the world. Um, the term entrepreneur um, mostly came about because of uh, the, this element of changing a pattern. However, we're finding, particularly with universities, um, that the term social innovation um, which is more all-encompassing, um, and also the term change maker, which is more inclusive, um, are finding much more resonance. So most of the universities that we work with um, are talking about social innovation um, initiatives across campus. Um, and I would say that uh, while Ashoka supports these leading social entrepreneurs, um, particularly with the university space, 
it is not about having every single student launch a venture at all. It's really not focused on the venture creation side. It's focused on this sense of identity and this sense of confidence that you can do something positive in the world and um, having various um, skill sets that again, we'll come back to in terms of learning outcomes um, across the courses that are being taught across the disciplines. And then in terms of the second question, um, just a little bit of context, every program within Ashoka operates like a social, uh, a social business. So Ashoka U um, finds ways, we have to walk the talk and be a social entrepreneur ourselves to survive. We have to be an overhead to Ashoka, the organization, and have to cover all of our salaries and things for a very small team. Um, so we have a little convening where we have ticket sales to cover costs, and we also have this uh, Change Maker Campus Initiative where we have a certification uh, process fee, um, but it's very much modeled after other accreditation and uh, certification uh, fees, so it's uh, pretty standard within the university space. Okay, great. Um, and just a few quick examples that the really the Change Maker Campus uh, story is, is about how different kinds of institutions are, are really thinking about the values of social innovation and change making um, in different geographic contexts, but also in different uh, institutional types. And we have, um, you know, starting on the right, Tulane University on, on one hand. Um, uh, I'll actually go to give the Tulane story right here. Um, it, it really started after Hurricane Katrina, and President Scott Cowan is there in his shorts. Um, and the boat, that they had to rebuild Tulane. And as they rebuilt Tulane, and almost the entire university was destroyed. Um, they rebuilt a sense of um, the values that they wanted to uh, attract people to Tulane for, and it was around service and rebuilding New Orleans. And so post Hurricane Katrina, they both start change their messaging about what kinds of students they were looking for, but the students that applied to Tulane basically said they wanted to come to help rebuild New Orleans and that they were deeply committed in the service ethic. Um, what's evolved over time is that as students have gotten involved in service and service learning, and Tulane, by the way, was one of the first universities across the country to have mandatory service learning of several hundred hours for all incoming freshmen. Um, so every single